Adam, welcome back to the podcast. Hey, thanks, Gary. I'm so excited to be here again after a number of years. It's great to be back. Well, I think it was only like two or three years ago. And at that time you were launching a church. And now we're talking about this like rocket ride that you've been on. I mean, the place that life takes you sometimes, right? Yeah, it's insane. Now, I mean, I was on talking about Downtown Harbor Church and creating a new church plant a number of years ago, which is still going. I'm still a part of it. Yeah. Um, my yeah. role changed and I stepped back into running all volunteering in the organization versus leading the organization. And that was a real healthy decision for me, but a lot can change in a couple of years, right? And here we are. So, yeah, which is which is insane when you think about it, Adam. Tell me, like, so Travelmation, which is what yeah. we're going to focus on, which uh, give us an idea of what it is today, and then we're going to reverse engineer it and sort of break down the story. Perfect. So I'll give you where we're at today. Travelmation is a full service travel agency. And you might ask the question, do travel agents still exist? <laughs> Interestingly enough, um, we do, and we're bringing them back in a really cool way. Um, but we are about 400 on our team currently of people all over the country. I wish that we've had a number of folks apply from Canada and we can't hire people from Canada, unfortunately. Oh, um, that's right. Is there a wall or like what happened? There, No, it just is. It's all the legal restrictions and requirements. Interestingly enough, Gary, to hire agents in Canada, we have to have a physical brick and mortar in the province, which we do not. Oh, so wow. there's just things that get in the way of that. That's another story for another time. But we are a travel agency of 400 agents, um, really focused on our brand, um, standing out versus a lot of other people in the space. And we are an authorized Disney vacation planner. So we specialize in Disney destinations, yet we do it all. So we just launched our 2020 marketing campaign about mm -hmm. a month ago called Disney and More, which is really exciting because one of the myths re we run into is, do you guys book more than Disney? So we're trying to redo how we do that. The answer is yes. But that's where we are today. We're a full service travel agency of about 400 agents around the country in the U.S. And distributed. I mean, I'm talking to you, for those of you watching on YouTube, uh, this is World Headquarters, correct, Adam? It is. This, is. this is World Headquarters in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. You see my Disney art wall in the back? Uh -huh. I, uh -huh. I actually have a new life-size Yoda coming from my office that'll be here Friday. I wish he could have joined us for the call, but he'll be here Friday. And so this is, this is Travelmation Headquarters. So this is what's so cool. I mean, I'm I'm at World Headquarters for my company, for those of you watching this episode, yeah. which is really, yeah. my, this is my basement. Like, welcome to my basement. And it's a nice basement, but it's my basement. We did a video shoot here all morning. Uh, I had some staff in, you know, we're doing an Airbnb retreat next week in San Diego where I'm flying people in for that. And you're literally in a, I know you designed the, the condo that you live in, but I mean, it's basically a spare yes. room, right? An office. Basically a spare room. It's an office. It was an add-on if we wanted to for the condo. This is what they called the den. It was an add-on if, if we wanted to do it. And we did. And here's world headquarters. So is that, is it for, pardon my ignorance, but for travel yeah. agencies, is that a large travel agency? Um uh, it's not necessarily, like if you look at the biggest of the big, there are agencies that have thousands, upwards of 10,000 agents. They've been around like for a long time. you mean? Yeah, or? and they're probably multi-level marketing agencies, Carrie, right. which we are not. We're not an MLM, we're not a pyramid. Um, but in terms of the Disney space, which is the space where we exist, we would be one of the, lar the larger agencies in terms of bodies. Okay, so... Yeah, for Disney, and you just got accredited by Disney. What was that? I saw that on social. Yeah, so it took us eight years. We started the company in 2012. When I started the company, it was just me. I like to kind of say it was just a guy on a couch with a laptop. That's all, right. I, that's all I had, and that's all I was doing. Um, and so Disney just gave us their authorized Disney Vacation Planner Platinum designation, which basically that means there's only one level higher than that, and that's Diamond. And there are the only three Diamond agencies in the entire country. Most of them have been around for a long, long time. Platinum is the level that is next, um, you know, highest under Diamond. But basically, our sales got us to the point where Disney gave us this um, distinction. And so it's it's been really fun to watch. Yeah, that's cool. And for such a new company, I mean... Within a year of recording this, Thomas Cook, the largest travel agency in the world, went bankrupt, right? Belly up. Correct. Correct. And uh, I would think it's harder times because you look at it between Airbnb and Expedia and all the sites, you know, hotels.com, booking.com, where you can book all your own stuff. Increasingly, that's what people are doing. So I, I, I'll just ask you this question. Why, why would you use a travel agency these days? 
So, Carrie, that's a very interesting question. So, yes, you can go on your own with what they call an OTA, an online travel agency. We saw that um, almost kill the travel agent in, call it the early 2000s, Expedia, Orbitz, Travelocity, um, Priceline, Hotels.com, all that kind of stuff. We saw that almost kill the travel agent. But what people were finding is, is yes, you could go on and book on your own, a hotel, a car, a flight, those kind of things. But if you're actually going to chunk down a good piece of money on vacation, right? You're gonna, because an average family in the Midwest will spend between four and $6,000 on a trip to Walt Disney World. They really feel like they wanna know what they're talking about. And so where we come in, especially from the perspective of not marking it up. We have been passionate about not marking travel up. There are many travel agencies that do, but we're basically free. So if you are getting a service that is complimentary to you with all accredited experts, why would you not use them to make sure your experience is the best that it can be, especially if you're gonna take one vacation a year and use and, and spend your hard-earned money? That's where we all come in, right? So um, then people ask, how do, you, how do you get compensated? Well, the vendors compensate us on the back end. So right. there's no cost to the client on the front end. So we get a kickback from the vendors in the back end. And so if someone comes to us and they say, I would really like to go to Walt Disney World with my family, please plan this. We do from start to finish. And we take care of their dining reservations, their fast passes, flights, resort ticket, all those kinds of things that happen. And it's at no extra cost to them. Furthermore, after we do that for a lot of clients the first time, they come back and they go, oh, I would never use anybody else again because you guys are phenomenal. Oh, wow. Okay, so this is really interesting. I just want to clarify one thing because, I mean, we've known each other for 100 years, long before you were doing what you were doing and I was doing what I'm doing, right? But uh, by kickback, you mean just the they give you a fee. It's not like uh, this is all like declared to the IRS and everything, just in case, just to avoid emails. You mean? Oh, <laughs> oh yes, they pay. Let me you let me say I mean. it in a different way. Oh no, they pay us a commission on the Thank sale, you. and then they send us a very large ten ninety nine at the end of the year. Yeah, that's right. You got to fill out all those forms. I know all about that. Yeah, so one hundred percent. I just wanted to clarify. It's like, uh, yeah, because sometimes the way that term is used, which is really interesting. So let's uh, let's go back to the beginning in twenty twelve. Yep. Where, how did this? Because entrepreneurship is so hot these days, right? And I want right. to I want to uh, talk about how you've structured your company, how you've grown your company, how you've gained all this traction in so little time. But um, take us back to what you were thinking in 2012 when it was you on your sofa with a laptop. What were you thinking? Well, I'll tell you what I was thinking because I remember it very vividly. I was a travel agent working for a company in Ohio. And, oh, wow. and oh, right. You did that part time. I did. That's I right. did it part. Well, because I was trying to help my friends and family go to Disney. I loved it. I, it was my passion. So I just did it. And I was a travel agent and the company I worked for was very not forward thinking. They were never going to grow a brand. There were good people involved in it. However, they weren't going to go anywhere or do anything. And frankly, just as if I can lay the cards on the table, because who knows who's listening to this, even from a part of that organization, is that they were fairly unorganized and mismanaged. And I said, I don't want to be a part of this anymore. And I knew based on personnel and the people I was working with that I couldn't help them get to the next level. I knew I had to go out on my own and do it. Plus, um, the payouts from this particular travel agency were not great. They were not in the favor of the travel agent. So what I did is I sat on my couch and I dreamed up Travelmation and I said, I'm not gonna take what I'm discontent about and cast that onto other people. I'm not just gonna create the same thing. I flipped the payout structure based on what I was discontent about and gave more to the agents on the front end, which is oh, wow. one of the things that our team has, I think, benefited from long-term in terms of growth. So with all that to say, I let the discontentment of an organization that I was a part of lead me into where I'm at today. Interestingly enough, Carrie, about three years after we started Travelmation, we absorbed the company that I used to work for. You ended up buying them out. <laughs> That's we, awesome. we didn't even buy them out. They came to us and asked if we would take them over because they didn't really know. I mean, they knew what they were doing in terms of the travel industry, in terms of knowledge about destinations, but they didn't know what they were doing necessarily from running an agency perspective. They were knowledgeable about the travel, but that's only half the battle, right? Mm -hmm. you, can, it, you have to be so knowledgeable about how to build a brand and how to take it to the next level and how to actually develop a strategy that people want to be a part of. That's what was lacking. That's what I brought to the table that was different. So what was the advantage to you in absorbing them, taking them over? 
more revenue under our books, um, <sighs> more, more, more people selling our brand. And so they wanted to do that. Plus, I mean, our commission structures were very aggressive in the industry in terms of the agent. We did that on purpose. And um, a- again, at that point in time in the company's history, I was interested in going, how do we go to the next level? Um, and I thought, you know, there are people here who've been in the industry a while. They might be able to come and bring something to our team. And sure enough, they did. Oh, wow. Okay. So um, you started that in 2012. Yep. Take us through the arc and a couple of pivot points or yeah. points where things really like kind of took off, you know, key markers in your sure. timeline. So again, starting the company in 2012, Just Me, was a very interesting thing because I honestly didn't think that it would be anything bigger than me just planning a couple of family and friends vacations a year. I did but not expect solo it to get- I'm going to work for so, myself rather than someone that's else. That's right. And I never expected to lead the local church either. I kind yeah. of expected yeah. that this would just be a side gig. Like everybody in ministry has a side hustle, right? That's what they all Seems say. That way. Yeah. So it's because, you know, it just, that was going to be my side hustle. So then there was a, a, a point in time where a woman named Michelle, who is now one of our VPs, she's our VP of events, um, saw on social media that I was doing this. Now, the interesting story about Michelle and I's relationship is, is that I worked for Michelle in college. I was a waiter at a bar that she owned in Toledo, Ohio area. So I, I Friday and Saturday nights, I would go pay for my tuition by serving at her pub and grub, right? And the, the old brick and mortars were consistently going out and it was difficult, specifically in the Midwest, to maintain this. So she had gotten out of that industry, asked me if she could jump on board our team if, if, if I wanted someone to do this with me. And I said, absolutely. We had had a couple of reps at that point. She came on very aggressive and, and really, that was a turning point for us when I had someone to bounce ideas off of, someone pushing me, someone thinking, you know, this really could be big alongside of me, which was really cool. So that was a mile marker uh, or, you know, in terms of our journey. The other thing that I would say is, Carrie, we started to do an annual retreat in Walt Disney World for our agents. We started mm-hmm. with nine agents five years ago at the retreat. This year, we just wrapped it up um, in January, and we had 208 reps come to the retreat and 10 vendors from the travel industry come. And when we started that event and we started to almost have our annual conference, those were some big mile markers because as much as I believe in the next generation of work and everybody working in their own environment, in their own space and, and, and being autonomous, which we can talk about that. I just believe there's something special when you get everybody around the table and have a rah-rah and who wouldn't want to have a rah-rah in Walt Disney World. Yeah. And so we started not, we started doing this and then it became a thing and we were taking promotional pictures in front of the castle. And then we had an opening night event where I casted vision and consistently do this. And then Lo and behold to the team, who shows up at the end of the event? Mickey Mouse himself. And all of a sudden, everybody is so fired up to be a part of what we're doing. And the interesting thing is, our reps in the travel industry consistently say to me, no one in this country is doing what you do for travel agents. No one. They said no one puts on production like Travelmation. No one cares about their team. Like This is such a special thing that I am so excited. So those were just a couple of, of moments in the history of the company that I think are big. Yeah, that's really interesting because, uh, you know, I've heard a growing number of business leaders say this. I think church leaders have a lot to learn from business leaders, but business sure. leaders can learn from church too. And the one thing church does really well is production. I mean, absolutely. If, if you look at that, right, the way a, a lot of churches put on weekend services or do events or communicate, we do that. We do that pretty well. So you took a yes. lot of those what we call service programming skills and throw absolutely. them into. I mean, you and I, we met at Orange through Reggie Joyner, right? Correct. Like there's there's few yeah. better events than the ones that Reggie yeah. throws. That guy knows how to throw a party. Yeah. He does. And I love Reggie and all he's taught me. He, I've, I've learned so much from him. But carry on our leadership team. So we have a leadership team of eight. Um, five of the leadership team, no, excuse me, six of the leadership team all came from the church world. Yeah. And one of them, one of our VPs was a former, former service programming director at a church. Brilliant. So, hey, deputize that person for the retreat, right? Yeah, absolutely. Be amazing. Yeah, for that's sure. cool. So that's a couple so of the things So can you explain for way. those who might not be familiar with what we're talking about, why people are tapping you on the shoulder going, nobody does this? Like, what are you doing for them other than taking them to Disneyland, literally, or Disney World? So 
the travel agency world almost died for a reason because it was old. It didn't change with the times. It's very similar to the local church. The local churches that choose not to change, uh, they encounter the same thing. Travel agencies wanted to be these brick and mortar shops where people would walk in and they they didn't support their agents necessarily. They didn't know how to rah-rah the team or build a brand. They were still printing paper airline tickets. And all of a sudden, with the introduction of the online travel agency, people said, I don't need them anymore. More. So when people say like what they said to me and they said, nobody's doing this in the travel industry is because we're not going back to the way it used to be. We're creating right, something right. completely brand new. We're creating something completely different because very few travel agencies have a brand. They're not, no one necessarily in the travel world, they're all the same. They're all the Disney agencies are the same, Carrie, whether it's Mickey's Vacations, this, Magical Vacations, this, Fairy Godmother, this. They're all Castle Consult. They're all kind of the same. So when Travelmation came around and people first said, what does that mean? Because it's travel and animation combined. When I got our lead, and all the brands are the same. The websites look like they're from the MySpace era. They're not, like, it's just, they're all kind of similar. It was ripe for disruption. It was ripe for disruption, absolutely. So when we came in and we said brand is really important to us, culture is really important to us, we want this to be the best place anybody's ever worked. We want to, them to know that they're supported with a clean, crisp brand that's out there that's focusing on digital. Um, and we're going to do everything we can to let people know they have a home and a place here and we're gonna help them take their book of business and their life to the next level. It, we've been winning at that. That's incredible. Okay, so I love uh, focusing on trends. So I want to test it, and you and I have chatted from time to time. But I see a couple of trends converging here in your company. Yeah. One is, and I wrote about this at the beginning of 2020, but I really think we live in the age of pre-sliced apples. So if you think about the trend of DIY, I think that is morphing to please do it for me. Just do it for me. So for example, you can buy an apple let's just say for argument's sake, it's 17 cents. But if the people at the supermarket or the store slice it up for you, they can charge you a dollar for the same apple. So you think about that for a minute, it's kind of dumb. Right. It's like, well, wait a minute, it's a knife. I have a knife. I could have done that myself in 30 seconds, but I'm going to pay somebody and I'll pay almost 10 X to have you slice my apple for me. I think that's a culture that is time famined. Like nobody has enough time to slice their own apples and decision fatigue. It's like, are you kidding me? I don't have time to make dinner. I can't even think about it. So I think you're seeing the do it for me, that idea of a turnkey, like why would, why, so you, we, we hinted at this earlier, but like a family rather than going on and booking on Disney and then booking their hotels on, um, you know, Trivago or whatever, and then booking a rental car and then booking this, they're like, we just, we just want you to do it for us. What Correct. is under that that you think? I think it's a cultural thing, like you mentioned. I think we live in an Amazon Instacart world where we don't want to go do things. We want things to show up at our front door. <laughs> and the other thing is, going back to what I originally said, is, is that once you find someone you trust and they've taken care of your dollars from a vacation perspective, you're going to go back to that person again because they've given you great service and um, you feel comfortable with them. And it is so easy to just text Adam, call Adam and go, hey, you have my family's uh, file started. We want to go back to Walt Disney World. Set us up. And you and we know that you're going to handle all the details for us and it doesn't cost us anything and we don't have to do anything other than communicate with you. Because Carrie, you got to understand something. Walt Disney World is overwhelming, specifically. Mm -hmm. It's very overwhelming. Well, I've been there a few I don't times know when, the last when my time kids you... were younger. I'll tell you, it is overwhelming and you are dead by the end of the... <laughs> this is not a relaxing vacation, right? It's one of those things that it's not relaxing. And it's very overwhelming because you can Google all day and look up attractions all day. But don't you want to talk to somebody who stayed at every resort on property and every they've ridden every attraction, they know all the restaurants, and they go, here's what my family likes. Just guide me so I don't have to do this myself because I'm pulling my hair out here. That's, that's the idea of we, thinking for me. Slice the apple for me, right? Correct. It's the same thing. And that's what we do specifically with Disney. And then why we've started to do so much other business is because the trust has been built with Disney. Now they trust us with cruises and all inclusives and hotels, all all that kind of you know travel. So you have stuff. morphed out from that. I've seen you on a whole bunch of ships lately. Some cruise oh, lines yeah. you're representing. What else have you kind of morphed into? And then why did you choose those areas next? Well, I think it's important for for people to understand that even though we can have a niche and a marketing 
uh, strategy related to Disney destinations, people are going to want to go other places in their life than Disney. Yeah. And so why would yeah. why would we not be affiliated with and become experts with other brands that people want to travel to so we could take care of them along the way? That's why. And the dollars increase too. We want revenue to be in our organization. We want them to use us for all their travel. So that's why we have branched out. It was the very smart business move to, to make. It's interesting though, Adam, I wanna, I wanna ask a little bit more around that because I can see it going either way. I can see some people like, you know, Apple makes one phone or now they make two or three, but right. under Steve Jobs, it's like, you know, Samsung had 20, Apple had one. I was reading a piece in a business uh, book this morning and it was like, you know, this guy talking to a Samsung executive, he said, it's really not fair because Apple only has one phone and they get to put everything they have into that one phone and we have to produce 30. So I don't get it. Um, right. So I think I could see the argument going the other way where they're like, no, we're Disney. Like nobody can out Disney us. So I'm just curious because I'm at the same crossroads. It's like, am I a podcaster? Am I a course content creator, I'm probably going broader as well. But what were your reasons other than what you've already shared for going broad? Or was that pretty much it? It's like, no, is I guess your target isn't Disney so much as the customer, the client. Is that it? Absolutely. And I think to answer that question as, as bluntly as I can, mm -hmm. there are, I, I think that families are eventually going to burn out of Disney. Now, I'm never going to burn out of Disney, yeah. okay? And it would be foolish to think, all keeping it within, within one concise Travelmation brand, right? Because that's important to us, mm -hmm. that we would, it would be foolish from a business perspective to think that we would not sell other things from a revenue standpoint. Um, it's out there. So, Carrie, just to give you perspective, when we started out, we were 100% focused on selling Disney destinations, and that was it. For the first three years of our organization, that was all we sold was Disney, 100%. Last year, Disney was only 62% of our revenue. Wow. Wow. So 38% of revenue was from other places because we, first of all, we can't be experts in everything. We understand that. But there are a lot of experts on our team who've traveled to these places. And so we kind of survey the team and lean into them. And we have folks who go, I want to go to Thailand. What does that look like? Can you help me do that? And the answer is yes, we absolutely can. I want to go on a cruise in the Mediterranean. Can you help me do that? Yes, we can help you do that. Um, and I think you're right. Good business people with good brands focus and we kind of focus and keep that all under the travelmation banner but it, we we were left with no choice to branch out because we were going to leave so much revenue on the table yeah i get it because and you're also focused on that family rather than just sorry only that family at disney right correct so exactly you want to you want to be like so are you trying to build a lifetime value of the customer so if the new hoff sign on on with you when we're 30 that this could be a 20 or 30 year journey where you plan our annual holiday Correct. And the other, absolutely. And the other thing that we get a lot from a lot of our clients is, hey, you've planned my Disney destinations vacation. Do you do other things? Can you plan a Royal Caribbean cruise for me? Can you? And the answer, like we get that question a lot. So yeah, the yeah. answer is yeah. yes. And so we're trying to put ourselves out there with some different marketing this year to be able to um, make people aware of it, get some more exposure to that we do do more. Um, yet Disney is still our bread and butter. What are the key differentiators and we covered on a lot, but just as far as the travel agency goes. So you're a virtual company and we I are. want to get into workforce in a little bit. Um, it's no additional cost to the client. What are some other disruptive factors about Travelmation that would be different from the traditional travel agent that we would have known growing up? Well, there's also, you, you mentioned the digital component. There's no brick and mortar. Um, we're, everything that we do is completely digital, which is a big deal. And the other thing is, so from the client's perspective, that's probably, you know, they, they deal with people remotely in the ways that they want to deal with them. But from our perspective, these people are completely autonomous. They're their own boss, mm -hmm. which they love. They're under our brand because they want to link a brand with their book of business. So we have some parameters that they have to follow. But Carrie, the one thing I've learned in my life that I could not put a dollar sign on is I've never been able to express how important it is for me to be my own boss. Mm. And these people are all their own bosses. They work as much as they want to work or as little as they want to work. We don't give them equipment that they have to use. They can use whatever equipment that they want to. We use cloud-based resources internally, so it works on any platform or any device. And what I love is that we have agents who are starting to live 
at travel destinations and kind of work from there, from the road. We had a couple who took their honeymoon, and the honeymoon was, I think, 70 days long, and they worked from their honeymoon. They went to Bali. They went to the Philippines. They were in China. They were in Thailand. And they lo- that's what people want in 2020. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's go there because okay. uh, you and I and you at a much bigger scale are running virtual companies. That was an early decision. Sounds like it wasn't a hard one. But talk about the shifting workplace because I've got this course, The High Impact Workplace, where I teach some of that from my perspective. I would yeah. love to know what you're learning because I think you and I are seeing a lot of the similar trends. Um. I have seen in the the trends with the, the the workplace changing is that number one, people want to be with their families more. They really do. Mm-hmm. They don't want to go to an office nine to five. They just don't. Um, number two, generally, if you're going from a, going to an office from nine to five, there's generally somebody telling you what to do in your office from nine to five, and people are tired of being told what to do. Yeah. Uh, they really are. The third thing is, is I I really believe that being able to work when you want to work and how you want to work is the future of the workplace. I do not believe, I do not believe that we are going to see specifically in the next five to 10 years, people consistently coming out of post-secondary education and going right into a job that they, that manages their time and gives them, you know, two to three weeks vacation time a year. Who would take a job that only had two or three weeks vacation time a year? I, I mean, I, I would go insane and I, I had that for a while and I understand why I didn't want that in the future. So, I mean, and that's the thing. And Carrie, it's interesting if I can aside for a second, a lot of our people, specifically people who come from the church world or from the corporate world, they get almost nervous when they come to work for Travel Nation when they go on vacation and they're like, is it okay that I'm gone? Are you, I mean, and I said, I don't manage your time. It has nothing to do with us. You go wherever you want to go. Mm. Uh, mm. It's, it's because there's been that culture for so long of fear related to it. And you can't post when you're gone and don't, you know, don't let it be known specifically in the church. And this drives mm. me crazy, mm. but it's like, you can't share that you're going to be gone too much or that you're boarding a plane again, because we don't want the church members, quote unquote, who pay your salary to think that you're not here enough. And so there is, we have seen that really just dissipate. And I think people, again, you can't put a dollar sign on what that means. Yeah, that's really interesting. So how do you manage that? Because we have a ton of employers from industry, church world, not-for-profit, the whole deal, um, you know, listening business leaders, and they're like, okay, I get it. The gig economy is growing. We have a whole bunch of independent contractors as well. But who gets their job done when they're not in the office? Like, how do you manage that with 400 team members? Or uh, what issues does that tend to create for you? Well, we have contracts in place with every one of our independent contractors. So they're all travel agents. And if they you know, don't abide by contracts, then legally we can just terminate them if we would like to, or they can terminate us if they don't want to work with us anymore. That's fine. For, for me, it's not about, first of all, let me just give you a couple of asides here, my yeah. friend. I have never seen someone work in a nine to five office from nine to five all day long. Uh, <laughs> you, I mean, the amount of wasted time in a nine to five culture is unbelievable. I remember working in the local church and like getting done with a meeting and like going to see my buddy down the hall. And I was like, what are you doing? He's like, well, I'm done. So I'm just watching Netflix. And I'm not joking yeah, yeah, because yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cause it's just like, I don't have anything else to do for the day, so, but I have to sit here till five o'clock. What a waste of time. So, well, but I the office was do- popular for a reason. It resonated. Absolutely. Abs- and so Carrie, to answer your question, I think the best leaders who are working in this new type of environment work on results-based systems and not time-based systems. 100%. It's because it's like, who wants to manage people's time? Who has yeah. time to do that? Who has time to sit down and go, I wonder what Kerry's doing. Is he in his office? Is he, is he working? Is he? It's such a counterproductive culture to actual results. So it's like, but I've also found what motivates people is not, um, is not, rewards like an office or something like that. What motivates people is the drive to do better for themselves. Mm -hmm. If our people don't sell travel, they don't get paid. Right. So you are commission-based, right? We are commission-based. And that doesn't work for everybody. Some people are like, no, I need a base. And we're like, okay, this isn't the organization for you. But if you are motivated by that and driven by that, there's no cap on the amount of money you could make. You could make a million dollars a year if you really tried. Wow. Which is insane, right? 
because a nine to five culture does not allow for that. Mm -hmm. How how do people get their um, how do people drum up their own business? Like how oh, how does that yeah, happen? Right. How do you manufacture leads? Is that their responsibility or yours? That is their responsibility to do. They are completely autonomous. Wow. Um, they they are using social media a lot. Now we we provide resources for them to do it. So we have a lot of marketing strategies and a, a lot of marketing calls that we do. Um, but it's their sole responsibility to find the leads. Now there are a lot of great things out there that they can use in the travel industry to get it. So. The, I, I guess the point is, is that when you find some special people who are driven and who go, I'm ready to drum this up myself, it can be amazing to watch how these people drum up momentum from the leads. And I owe Mark Zuckerberg a lot. I really mm. do. Because Facebook has been massive for us. And you know how much money Facebook costs us? Zero. Really? I mean, we can pay for ads. I mean, we have paid for ads before, but to use it for our not only our closed group for travel agents, but for agents to drum up business, it's unbelievably amazing what they've been able to do for free. Yeah, that's amazing, isn't it? When you when you yeah. look at that. So they're responsible. How do you select? Because you now got, you know, workplace at relative scale. How do you select people who are cool with that? Like not everybody's entrepreneurial enough to do that. They would be like, no, I need you to send me leads and then I'll see if I can convert some of these is there a process you use to figure out who's suited for that? Well, Carrie, it's so interesting. So, and I want to preface what I'm going to say with this statement. Someone at a travel event recently asked me, they said, you know, how do you hire your independent contractors basically? And it's very difficult because we have to go through the applications. We have to interview them. We have to look at their social profiles to see if we think this is something that they could do. First of all, we have a supervisor team that manages that. But it's so interesting related to the question that you just asked, because someone said to me recently um, at a travel event, and they were impressed by the size of our company of being like 400 independent contractors. And they said, what was your job before you did this? And I said, well, I worked in churches. And they said, what did you do in churches? And I said, well, I communicated and spoke a lot. I said, but my main thing that I did in the local church was I worked with volunteers. In fact, I've written a number of books on volunteering. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh my gosh, we've just put it together. Working with independent contractors is exactly like working with volunteers. Ah, you're right. And I, ne I never thought about it that way. And I, was, and I love volunteers. I still do it uh, at my local church. And I'm like, this is why we're winning because we've taken those strategies and we've put them into practice in working with independent contractors. And much like volunteers, you don't know who's going to be good at what. You just don't. You're trying to plug them in. They're going, okay, I'm in for this. How do, how do I do this? And so it's hard to figure out their right spot with us, just like it's hard to figure out where volunteers fit. But once we figure out that we get some of those people in the right places, man, watch them Okay, sort. this is fascinating. And we'll link to episode 92 when you were first on. Yeah. Um, and you have written some books on volunteers. But just to touch down on it, we'll link to your book. What, what are one or two of the principles that work with volunteers that also work with independent contractors? They don't have to do anything if they don't want to. <laughs> they, they have no obligation to do anything, which means your culture has to be the thing that inspires them. That's so important to me. If your culture and purpose behind what they do inspires them, forget it, they'll show up all day long. Now, with Travelmation, there's dollars attached to it. So like when they do that, but like, I mean, we, we casted vision last year about our culture, not only as an organization, but the way that we serve our clients, focusing on families and memories and these things that people make on vacations and that you're the you're the watch guard of, over their trip. How inspirational is that? That as people get older and pass away and at their funerals, they talk about these vacations that they took. That's your responsibility. That's your job. So um, culture, they don't have to do anything. So it's got to be about inspiring them to win and creating a culture like that. That's so, so key. The second thing related to volunteers is that, that I've just taken forward as it relates to independent contractors is that all volunteers are not good at everything and that's okay. And everybody's not going to be a travel agent and not going to be a great one. And that's okay. This is not the place for them. And don't be afraid of that. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Anything else on selection? Like, how do you know that this person is going to be a good travel mation uh, team member and whether it's like, nah, this probably isn't for you, Carrie. 
if there is a strong social presence that they have already personally, we take a look at that as we evaluate, and that's one of our hiring factors. We have denied people um, based on, like, we don't hire people who talk about politics all the time on social media. We think that is a complete lose for your company, like for your future business. But we kind of look at people and we go, how are you running social already? Are people interacting with you? Are you doing well on social from a personal standpoint? Because people who do well on social um, consistently do well as travel agents. It's, It's almost like a a parallel. We have some Instagram influencers who've joined the team. They all kill it. We have our top sales guy has a phenomenal social presence and he's selling unbelievable amounts of, of travel and he's got an amazing social presence. It's, it's fantastic. Isn't that interesting. It's funny. I, uh, I remember meeting, this was in Horst Schultze. It was another uh, hotel owner. And he says that there are really surprising correlations. Like for example, the best uh, valet and door people at a high-end hotel uh, are actually are gardeners and people who enjoy being outside. And wow. so if on the prof- really weird correlation, it's like, no, you're moving cars and opening the doors for people. They don't want an indoor job. If they love gardening as a hobby, if they love being outdoors, it's like, ah, don't put me behind that desk. Like all it's minus 20 and I'm out here. It's, uh, it's 90 degrees. I'm out here. And yeah. they just love being outside. And so they started looking for that correlation. And that's really interesting. Yeah, because I imagine it's a fairly high EI position too when managing a family's vacation. If you got somebody who's always posting dumb stuff to social or <laughs> showing low emotional intelligence, that's going to translate in the company as well. If you have a poor social presence, the people who follow you are not going to book with you. <laughs> okay. I mean, yeah, it's fair. Yeah. It's just they're not going, bottom line, they're not going to. If you don't seem engaged, if you don't seem engaging, if you don't interact with anyone, uh, then they're not going to They're not going to trust you with their trip, bottom line. Hmm. So we talked about some of the, like, it's, an, it's a meteoric journey for you to become such a major provider in a large company in such a short window of time. What have been some of the struggles? What have been some of the pain points, Adam? I will tell you the largest p- pain point for me, and it's it's not necessarily a pain point as much as it is a struggle for me in leadership. Sure. And, and it's not something I struggle with. I think it's something that all good leaders struggle with when you have a leadership team like I do. It's the biggest struggle is keeping all those leaders on the same page. Mm-hmm. And that is to know, if I said to our, I said, we could be the largest Disney affinity travel agency in the USA if all of our leadership can just stay right on the same page. If our train can stay on the tracks, that's what I that's yeah, the phrase yeah, that yeah. I use. Because inevitably carry and Vince McMahon, who is one of the leaders I've learned the most from in my life. I don't know if you know who Vince McMahon is or not, actually. but he is the guy who has started the WWE World Wrestling Entertainment. Awesome. Um of course that's become a billion dollar corporation, so obviously yeah. he did something right, but one of the things he said is that the best leaders are the leaders who bring everybody into the room or the virtual room, listen to all the opinions, and then make a decision with conviction, and then the leaders follow them anyway. Mm. And that is so key to the way that I lead because I go, you may not like what I have to say, you may not agree with what I have to say, but at least I'm going to tell you honestly what I what I think, and I'm going to have to make a decision. And that I don't think our leaders tend to go off the rails, but every so, because it's natural for human beings to have different ideas about the way that they think things should go. So, and I have to consistently set that vision for the company because Travelmation is not just a travel agency. It's a brand. It's its own brand out there. So we have to, in the context of the brand, keep the train on the tracks. And if we can consistently do that, if I can do that, I think we're going to continually, the sky is the limit, my friend. Hmm. What are some of the obstacles to keep it? I know we all know vision leaks and everything, but why do you think, do you think like digital makes it harder? Like having a virtual company makes it harder to keep everyone on the same page or not really? You think that's just a human condition? I think it's a human condition. I don't think digital makes it harder because you can still keep in touch with everybody consistently, even from a digital standpoint. I just feel like with autonomy and freedom, which is what we give people, you get autonomy and freedom. <laughs> yeah, you do. So so with that said, we have to figure out how to keep brand going in the same direction, going in the direction it needs to go with everybody having 
their own reins. And and Carrie, as God is my witness, I have no idea how we've done it as successful as we have so far, but it's gone really well. But that will consistently be our our challenge is keeping everybody on the same page. Hmm. Um, when you think about your lead team, are there different yep. expectations for your vice presidents, for your lead team than you would have for your agents? Like, is there a tighter amount of synchronization that happens at that level or still it's freedom and autonomy all the way around? Well, for our VPs, so they're all executors, right? So we have four VPs. I love our VP team. So we have a VP of events. I talked to you about her a little earlier, Michelle. We have a VP of innovation and strategy. His name is Alston. I think you know Alston. I think so too. We have, um, yeah. And then we have Tim, who is our VP of development. So he runs all of our training. And then we have Christina, who's our VP of admin and finance. And so all of them have their own book of business, which they're free to run however they want to, but they also have some responsibilities from the company standpoint. And and that's where we just have to consistently try to be on the same page, right? Right. Because in their area, we want to give them freedom to lead, yet we also have to stay on brand. And that's the challenge. That's the most interesting thing. I will tell you this though, Carrie, I've never worked in my life with a leadership team. I have a leadership team of eight because there's three additional supervisors who don't oversee a specific aspect of the company. They oversee their own team, but I've never worked with a more excellent group of people in my entire life. They're phenomenal. Wow. Yeah. How do you, how do you go about uh, finding senior leaders like that? Are they mostly people you knew or uh, do you advertise broadly? How how have you built the team? I'm going to give you an answer that might be non-traditional to this question. Great. In me choosing leaders on our team, I choose people that I can trust. I choose people who are almost my friends. And people go, don't hire your friends. I say, I don't like that. Hire your friends. You can work as long as you're an honest and good leader and you lead with integrity, it should never affect your friendship. And so a lot of these people who are in our leadership team are people who were friends, have been friends of mine for years. I think you see that more and more. I look at a lot of entrepreneurs and they're hiring people they went to high school with. They're hiring people that they've known for a long time, which is interesting. Anything else on the running or the scaling of the business? I mean, some days it must feel like you've got whiplash. It does because we, Carrie, since the beginning of the year, um, we've gotten like 65 applications to be travel agents since, and, and we're only in the second month of the year. And when yeah, you're listening are. to this, so we've had 65 yeah. new people who want to onboard. Who, who want to onboard, right? Um, that's a, a massive jump in terms of, and so scaling is always interesting to us. So one of the things that was really important for us in terms of scale was when new agents, and this can apply to any business, in new age, when new agents come on board, we wanted to let them know that they were supported. Okay, that was a, support mm-hmm. was a big thing to us because when you're an independent contractor and you're your own boss, yes, you are your own boss, but there's nobody holding you accountable. So, and, and that, we do that on purpose because we don't want to run their life, yet we also want them to know they're supported. So we have a supervisor system in place that allows a lead agent, a supervisor to oversee their team of agents and they're there for their support. That has allowed us to scale. Carrie, we could scale up to thousands of agents on this team. Oh, wow. So, well, you'll probably get another hundred applications after this thing airs. So, uh, Yeah, I actually told our leadership team, I said, hey, I'm going on Carrie's podcast. Are you guys ready to interview a whole bunch of people? Given that there's 30 to 40,000 people who will hear this episode, there's probably, yeah, yeah, you're probably going to get a couple applications, I would think. Yeah, probably. And and we welcome that. We just can't hire anybody from Canada. So if you're in Canada, sorry. No, most most of my listeners are American, which is great. Um, So uh, just shifting gears a little bit, what makes for a great experience when a family visits Disney? Because I think just about everybody listening to this podcast either has been, will be soon, or hopes to be sometime at Disney. What are some things that you're like, oh, if you want the icing on the cake, do this? Well, the first question we ask all of our clients, and I ask my personal clients as, as well as I go, tell me what kind of experience you would like to have, because this is your trip. I'm just here to help make it happen. And so some people get up and they go, I want to go in, I want to be in the park from the time it opens to the time it closes all day. And I go, we can make that happen. And then some people go, I would love to do a couple of days in the park, maybe four or five, and I'd like to stay for a week and I'd love to be leisurely the rest of them. Or I'd like to go. So the first question we ask is, hey, what 
um, kind of experience do you want to have uh, during your Walt Disney World visit? Because it's all about us making the client's dreams come true. It's not about our dreams. Remember, I love the Country Bear Jamboree, Carrie. <laughs> there are a lot of people who are not going to want to go to the Country Bear Jamboree, and that's okay. So I think that we start there. The second thing is, is we always try to give our clients some of the biggest and the newest and the best at Walt Disney World and other Disney destinations. So Star Wars Galaxy's Edge has recently opened with their biggest attraction ever, Rise of the Resistance. It's unbelievable. Um, very, so Hollywood Studios has gone through a massive transformation in the past five years. So we help lead our clients through that. But it does... Like there are some really special things that clients can do, including the Bippity Boppity Boutique for little girls. You want to spend $350 to make your daughter looking like a princess? We can handle that for you. No problem. Um, so like there are just special things that a lot of people don't know about because Disney's very overwhelming. The other thing, Carrie, is that what, one of the things that's become really cool in the past number of years at Disney is dining. A lot oh, of yeah. foodies oh, go to Disney because there's so many amazing restaurants on site and uh, our team has eaten at many of them, if not all of them. And so we just guide our clients to have that amazing food experience as well. And you can have a buffet experience, if that's what you're looking for. You can have a character experience, or you can eat at the finest five-star restaurants in the United States at Walt Disney World. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah because, I mean, the stereotype is you're going to eat burgers and hot dogs for a few days, but that's not the case at all. Yeah. You can you can do that if that's what you want to do, but you don't have to. There, right. there, There's some amazing restaurants. Some of my favorite restaurants are at Disney's Grand Floridian Resort and Spa. You'll notice that, like, in my language as well, that Disney's trained us well because... I don't just say the Grand Floridian. I don't just say, you know, Walt Disney or Disney World. I say Walt Disney World. I say Disney's Grand Floridian Resort and Spa because we have to say the full names when ah, we're talking to folks. Okay, that's it. Walt Disney World. So, there you go. Yeah. And so at Disney's Grand Floridian Resort and Spa, they have some amazing restaurants that are there. Five stars. Victoria and Albert's is one of the highest rated restaurants in the country. And, and so you have some people have no idea about the experiences you can have with dining at the Walt Disney World Resort. It's phenomenal. Wow. How did you get on Disney's radar? So I had the travel agency and I got affiliated with Disney destinations. And all of a sudden, over the course of time, two things matter to Disney, right? As I think two things matter to many people in business, revenue and brand. Yeah. And we have both. So that's, that's how we got on their radar. Because you're basically, every other picture I see on Instagram, you're with Mickey hanging out with him, you know? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Pretty cool. M meeting, with the, meeting with the boss, right? right like, right. I got to go check in with the boss and make sure things are well. And he loves us and we love him. That's fine. So, but, so it's, it's so funny because I know you and I are, uh, you know, shoe guys, Carrie. We both like our shoes. Uh-huh. So I love, I love my shoes. And somebody, you know, when I was working at a local church one time, I had a nice pair of shoes on and I was, I was wearing them and I walked in and somebody made a comment to me and they go, oh, nice shoes. This church must be paying well. And I go, nah, Mickey paid for these. <laughs> That's, That's what happened, you know, because on, and going back to that idea in the local church, there, there is something versus entrepreneurship versus being in the local church that, you know, you are capped in terms of earnings and that's not a bad thing. Some people, I, you're, you're capped in terms well, of and almost any potential. job that you're not in control of you're capped in earnings, Correct. right? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So Adam, you know, let's circle back to culture because I hear this in almost all of your answers. Like you're thinking about the experience of the guest, what you know about Disney and everything. What else do you do to really create a great culture in a distributed company? Well, I think one of the things about workplaces and corporations, business places, churches that allows them to not be what they could someday I'm not even going to say fail, but I'm going to say not be what they could someday is a lack of culture. So, mm -hmm. so one of our highest priorities is on culture. Um, it's so funny because people consistently say to me, and this is just a, a heartbreaker for me, but it's, it's so true. They, and I heard this so many times. They said, people just say, thank you for what you do because I've never had a boss or an organization that I actually feel like cares about me and not just what I do. And I, I find that to be so interesting and I'm almost humbled by it. I don't know what to say in response to it other than, well, thank you so much for saying that. But Carrie, I think that one of the things, uh, many of our leadership team members came from the local church. And amongst our travel agents, Christians or not Christians, because of course we hire anybody, there's no prereq to be a part of our organization, right? We're kind of like a church. 
And and I mean like we are we are run like a church. And and that is a very interesting thing because all of us, even though we're not full time in the local church anymore, uh, many of us on our leadership team, we've grown up in church and we love the local church. And so we've taken a lot of those values, those intrinsic values, and we have um taken them forward. Interestingly enough, so in our closed Facebook group, which is a resource that is unbelievable to our team because they get questions. It's like a 24 hour a day, seven day a week help desk. They get answers within minutes and it's amazing. But one of the things that people do a lot of times in the Facebook group is they will ask um, for prayer. They'll ask for prayer requests for their family or friends or even a client who might be going through something. And someone said to me one time, who's a part of our team, could we create a separate Facebook group just for prayer requests? And I said, I don't want to do that. I said, because I want all of our team to see these requests and know that they're being prayed for by great people on this team. And so, um, and we're a travel agency, right? Like that is, I mean, that that in itself is so powerful and cool. And it and it's also made me know, because there was a lot of personal guilt when I left the full-time job at the local church, if I'm being honest, yeah, there just yeah, was. Yeah. And, I, and I, fought, I fought against that. Um, I didn't want to have that, but I, I felt, because I started the organization. Yeah, right? you started the too- church and a couple of years after you launched it, you're like, John, do you want to run this? Because I'm going to, I remember that text or that phone call that you and I had. You're like, actually, I'm going to yeah. do this full time. Yeah, and I said, and by the way, John is doing, um, if you go back and listen to episode 92, you'll hear from yeah. John. John is absolutely killing it. And people say to me all the time, you're still a part of a church that you felt comfortable, you know, giving up the stage and just not being up there every week. I said, absolutely, I do. I, I said, not that hard, I, is it, Adam? <laughs> it's not that hard. And I it's said, not that I, hard. I'm, John is thriving and killing yeah, it. Yeah. And he, I'm so proud of him and what he's done. Like, it's awesome. Mm-hmm. Anyway, all that to say, it's, it, there was a lot of guilt when I left the local church full time. But Carrie, when I've seen, what God can even do through an organization like Travelmation, you realize that the church is not just confined to those walls mm-hmm. in any way. And there's so many amazing things happening. We um, we brought a kid at our opening night event um, on stage this year who was battling bone cancer last year. And um, we had a chance, a lot of our team did, to pray for him throughout the last year. He had just completed chemo right before our retreat. He'd gone through chemo for 10 months. And it, can they see my screen on YouTube oh, yeah. if people are watching uh, Yeah, this? go so, ahead and uh, so share that. It's just a fun thing. So this is a lightsaber I made at Galaxy's wow. Edge. If you turn it on, you can see it gets goes green. It's Luke's l- lightsaber from episode six. And I made one when I went to Galaxy's Edge for the first time. And... Along the way, when this kid, his name is Nolan, came to the retreat, we gave him that exact lightsaber, a replica of it. And I said, here's the deal. You have one, I have one. And that just, when you see it, you're just going to know that you're being prayed for by a whole bunch of people and that you have an amazing future ahead of you. People are crying. I mean, it's just a very powerful moment. But our travel agency did that because we believe in that. That's what culture is. Mm -hmm. And so when we put an emphasis there, Man, we just feel like people engage. And, and it's it's not a fake emphasis either. A lot of times people go, oh, well, you know, you're just doing this to build brand. And no, we actually believe in this. We mm-hmm. we believe in it with all of our hearts, which is really key, I think. I think, Adam, and I'd love your reaction to this, but I, I still, and I get in trouble every time I say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. I right. do think churches have a lot to learn from businesses because churches are not particularly well run a lot. But businesses have a lot to learn from churches. And if you look at where business is going, the emergence of ethical business and compassionate business and business beyond the bottom line. And, you know, I've, I've seen my company, you see your company really as ministry and as a place where we care for people and a place where, wow, this is the best place I've ever worked or this is the best job I've ever had or I feel valued. Do you see that as another cultural shift that is happening right now where there's more cross-pollination? 100% carry because I feel like, number one, I understand why church leaders don't like it when we say, hey, you, you churches could learn a lot from the business world, and they and they could. Some of the worst leadership things I've ever seen happen have been involved in the local church. Yeah. Um, it's just, I mean, I see a lot of bad decisions being made to where, I hear in you. fact, when we started Downtown Harbor Church, one of the things we said is we were going to take all the things that we didn't like and not ever do them. <laughs> so... Um, but I do think that the business world could learn a lot from the local church as well. I, I really believe that because even, again, all organizations have their things that they go through and that don't work the way that they should. But the business world could learn a lot about culture from the, the local church. I really believe they could. 
And about caring for people and about yes. loving people and all those things because you tend to be a commodity in business. And then sometimes we don't take the leadership end seriously enough in church world, which is what, one of the reasons I love this podcast is we seem to mishmash between the two on a regular basis, which is a lot of fun. So yeah. tell me about where Travel Mation is heading next and what's next for you, Adam. Great, great question, Carrie. It's one of my favorites to answer. So I said this at our retreat uh, just a few uh, weeks ago in Walt Disney World to our team. I said Travelmation is going to be the largest and most influential travel agency in the Disney destination space. Bottom line, wow. watch us soar because it's going to happen. I, I announced this to our team in 2019. We set out a goal. Uh, it's, well, I set the goal in 2018, but we achieved it in 2019. I said, here's what we're going to do in 2019. We're going to double the size of the company. We're going to double the size of the company in terms of revenue and in terms of agents. And we did. We met our goals. Incredible. We put it out there and we, we totally slated. It. it was amazing. And now we're on our journey to become the largest and most influential travel agency in the Disney destination space. That's what we're going to be. And that's what we're going to do. Not because we just want to be the biggest. It has nothing to do with that. It's because I truly believe that our culture in our organization is the best and it translates to our clients. And if we believe that we are the biggest and the best out there and we're doing things to the best of our ability, why wouldn't we want more and more people to experience that? Hmm. Um, and so that's what we're gonna do. Wow, and anything else you wanna share, Adam? Oh man, I just would say, number one, a lot of people's hearts inside local churches. I'm just gonna be, can I just be blunt and transparent yeah, at the end of this, totally Gary? blunt. I tell my journey um, just briefly is that I knew it was time for me to leave my job at the local church 16 to 18 months before I did it full time. And that was very, we were not even in the church for that long yet, but I knew it wasn't for me and I could, was feeling the pressure of it. There are many people who are listening to this, that this is you and you know that it's time and it's time to make some decisions and you're, you're, you're making yourself and probably the church miserable by not executing what you need to do. Um, I, I just, for anybody who will hear my voice, know that it is a painstaking, guilt-ridden, hard decision, but it was the right one. And now, because I did get out of the way, the local, my, our church is thriving and growing. It's doing amazing. And I'm still there to be a part of it. That's just my word, Carrie, personally, to anybody who might be in that same boat themselves. It's really, it's a hard thing, but it was such a right thing. And then the second thing is this, is that you never know what can happen with a dream and a laptop. It was one of those things where it used to be a notebook and a, you know, like a, a notebook and a dream or whatever. You never know what can happen if you just take a leap. You never know. Can we talk about that guilt that you felt uh, as you exited? Do you know where that came from? What part of that may have been healthy? What part was unhealthy? I think that the local church has unfortunately throughout its history created a culture of guilt. Hmm. I believe that one of the things that I was told in my ministry career, um, and this was probably midway through my, I still have a ministry career, but it's just not full time anymore. Um, one of the things I was told is, as we were sitting around having a staff meeting, that there were some pastors who um, were no, like had used to work at the church I was at, and they're no longer pastors. They were doing different things. They were real estate agents, or maybe they were working in a different field. And, and it was said by the local church leaders that I was around well, you know what? That just really shows that they didn't truly have a call to ministry on their life or they would have been in this long term. Wow. And, I, and I said to myself, oh, that never left me. And I said, wow. That, and, and, and it was something that I completely 1 million percent being on the other side of it disagree with. Um, and, I, and I think that there is a culture of guilt inside the local church that if you're not full-time from a full-time career perspective serving Jesus— then you must not be fulfilling the perceived call on your life. I think that's a real thing that exists. And uh, the guilt was not healthy. The guilt was probably unhealthy, but I think it was normal. I think it was probably natural. But um, once I got through that and I realized I'm not really going to give this a second thought ever again about my journey, and, and, and through that I've been able to watch God bless our organization in amazing ways, and he is still working through this organization, Travelmation, as much as he was using me inside of the local church as well. Mm. What helped you move past that? Because I felt that a little bit too, right? And increasingly now, five years on the other side of succession, I'm seeing full 20 years of being a lead pastor as an assignment 
but I'm still called. I'm just called to a new assignment, which is to help people thrive in life and leadership. And it looks different than it did before. Uh, But that, that took a little bit of adjustment as well. What was the turning point for you where you're like, yeah, this is, this is still very much a faithful use of my life. So ironically enough, um, through this, I think I'll just be very transparent. I think that therapy is very good for people. And I think that if you're in a, I think that everybody should probably go through it once. I think it's very good. And so throughout this time, I was just talking to somebody, not in a Mm. medical way, but just kind of getting my thoughts out there and, and coinciding with that, there has been a movement in the Christian faith. Now I have not Christian circles and even leadership circles where I have not read this resource, but there have been people around me who've read the book, Girl, Stop Apologizing. Oh yeah, Rachel Um, Hollis. I haven't read it either, but. Yeah, yeah, so I haven't read it, but I'm familiar with some of the concepts, and some of those concepts translate to, you know, everyone's life. And so throughout that, I started to just see some articles posted about that and some literature posted about that. And I think that one of the things that I've really taken a hold of in my life in the past two or three years is I am going to stop apologizing for being me. I have apologized for being me for 18 years ever since I started working inside of a local church. I was always sorry. I always felt like I had to apologize for making a decision or doing something that quote unquote I shouldn't have done or dressing a certain way. I, I never was comfortable with that. And so I, I've stopped apologizing for things. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, because I think there is kind of a cultural fit and you fit or you don't and on the edges of leadership. And that can, that can play out in a number of different ways. Thanks for being so transparent about that. Adam, Absolutely. and I know you continue to be a huge supporter of the church that you helped start, and you're involved in it, engaged in it, and uh, that's what I want to be too. This has been really refreshing. Well, if you're ready for a couple of people to apply, where can they learn more <laughs> about Travelmation <laughs> and about you it's, online? It's so funny because I always like when I do these things. I know this is about Travelmation, but when I um, sometimes do like you know ministry gigs, it's so yeah. funny because people will want to talk about volunteering, and inevitably there's somebody who will pull me aside after a speaking engagement or whatever, and they'll go, "How can I apply to be a Travelmation agent?" <laughs> so if you're, let me just give you the pitch: if you're listening out there and want to be a part of the best travel agency in the United States, you can visit Travelmation.net and click the Join Our Team tab. And if you just heard me say that and you thought, he should have been on the radio, I get that a lot as well. (laughs) There you go. Adam Duckworth, it's been a joy. I love it anytime we get together. Thanks so much. uh, This won't be the last time I'm sure we're all going to be watching with great enthusiasm. And just thanks for your candor and thanks for your honesty today. Gary, thanks for having me. It's been my pleasure. Thank you.